Imagine being an artist where you are growing and harvesting the very fibers you're making your artwork with. Karen Hampton is an artist who weaves together tapestries, images, and stories into her artwork. And she's now ventured into having her very own farm where she can grow some of the threads that she uses to weave with and grow some of the flowers and plants that she can color her artwork with. And not only that, she's also dreaming into creating a residency for artists to come and learn and connect more deeply with the land and with the fibers that they're working with. She sees land and soil as vehicles for healing and connection and transformation. In this interview, we explore the sanctuary of land and soil, what it's been like for her to discover how racism has showed up in her world of being an artist and what she's learned from that and how she's transforming, rewilding and rewriting that story for not just herself, but for humanity and for where we are in this world today and where it's possible to be in harmony with each other and with the land and the soil and all of nature around us. And there's gardening hacks peppered throughout the interview. So listen for those. Thank you so much for joining us. I'm Natalie Forsbauer, publisher and editor in chief of Heart and Soil Magazine. You're welcome to sign up for a free newsletter or join our membership. Be sure to subscribe and ding that bell so you know when our next interviews drop. And thank you so much for being part of this community and being part of global regeneration and planetary health. You make yourself an amazing day and enjoy this interview with Karen Hampton, artist and farmer. Karen, it is an honor to be in the room with you today talking about your art and exploring how uh, you're just how, where your journey has taken you from a very young age to where you are today and how it's all connected to the land and healing and farming. So welcome to welcome, just welcome to the Heart and Soul community. We're honored to have you be a part of it. Thank you. Yeah. So Karen, um, you're an artist and you're also a farmer. And I'm really curious how the two connect. Can you tell us about that? How do they connect? Well, it's one, one thing that I would say is that I have my inside world and I have my outside world. And for me, it's really important for me to ground and be in the dirt. Mm -hmm. And when I'm in the dirt, then I'm really there. I'm really, really there. And when I'm in, when I'm working in the studio, I'm really using my head a lot. Mm -hmm. And I'm really trying to, um, I'm working on crafting something. I'm thinking about, um, I'm thinking about my, um, my logistical process, which is the same way as it is outside, but it's, you know, that it's, it's very tuned into my studio and it's tuned into my materials and, and all of these things. And I guess the connecting point is, is that I use all natural fibers in the studio. And I am, for most of my career, I would say I've used natural dyes. And so really working with plants and creating dyes and um, and have been really active in the the textile community in in respect to um, to that and to storytelling. Mm. So, you know Ooh, and, I, uh, and I do stuff on um, uh, I do a lot of, I do re research-based work. So that is involved in the landscape as well. Mm -hmm. And what do you mean by research-based work? Um, for about the last 
30 years, I guess it's that, yeah, it is that long now. So my work is research-based. And for me, that that entails a um, sense of place. And so whatever whatever my project is, I frequently don't know anything about it. I'm pretty naive about the subject. And so I have to approach it in a very methodical way to discover the the story, the history, the um the location, everything that that is involved. Mm -hmm. um, an example being when um in 2013, I was all of a sudden kind of picked out of the air, it felt like, um, to have a show in an exhibit in um, central New York. And I knew nothing about central New York. I couldn't identify what the area was or anything. And when I spoke with the with my curator, um, the only thing I, I knew two things. I knew that Harriet Tubman had lived in Auburn, New York, and I knew that Frederick Douglass had lived in Rochester. I didn't have any clue as to how far apart they were, anything like that. But when I spoke to this curator, I asked, I said, I've seen a photograph of a young, Fre of Frederick Douglass Young, and he was at some sort of convention. And she said, that's the Casnovia Convention and the photographs held in the Historical Society in the next town. And that launched me into an entire, um, an entire knowing of the abolitionist movement in central New York. And it included going and driving from location to location to location and feeling the land. And kind of in a way, it's kind of like seeing the the below the the surface of a place, what it is now, but seeing it back in history and finding finding little things. And then you bring that experience and that energy into your artwork through yes. what you see and you feel. That's super powerful. You talk about the land um, and soil being a healing place. And is that part of your journey as well? Absolutely. Um, and when I was growing up, one of the, the kind of the, my first real experience with the lands, land and dirt. Well, actually it was really my second experience because we had a garden when I was in school, when I was in elementary school. And so that was my number one experience. My second experience was when my parents were getting divorced and my father decided that my mother should take us to my sister and I to Jamaica to so that he could move out without any any kind of disturbances and my grandmother stayed and um, my grandmother decided to have a to take down um, a black walnut tree in a fenced in part of our yard and to and so she went to our next door neighbors who were Japanese gardeners a couple generations of Japanese gardeners and and to take the tree down and prepare the soil and everything. And they, and we had a banana tree that was back there and they took the banana tree and they buried it. And to me, that was like, wow, you don't just take it away. You actually bury it. And that makes your soil better was like this knowledge of, wow, this is magical. And they were, those neighbors who lived next door to me my whole life as a child until I was 17 and left home, 
taught me so much about gardening and about the love of it and how to do things in small spaces, you know, because their yard was maybe half the size of our yard. And we had the big trees and they had the trees in bond size so, so that they could pick everything by without standing on a ladder in their yard. Wow. So um, tell, tell us, tell me more about what you learned about gardening in small spaces and growing food in small spaces. Well, it was that it could be done, that it, that you didn't have to have this huge amount of space to be able to do it. You know, that, you know, we were in a neighborhood in LA, you know, I mean, I was a kid that when I learned to ride my bike and could ride my bike, I would go ride my bike through alleys and pick fruit, you know, because I realized Southern California was this like magnificent place that lots of things grew and that they grew, you know, and then my next door neighbors, they harnessed all of this and where, you know, we had, we had, uh, persimmon tree that bore about 150 pounds of persimmons a year and so my mother would always have someone come and take all the persimmons down and then she would have them set so that they would ripen so the birds wouldn't get them and but I would watch my neighbors and they could just go and pick them and it was just this regular part of their life. And so I learned a lot about, you know, my first thing about different varieties and and all sorts of things, you know. And the grandfather never spoke any English. And, you know, and we just developed this friendship that that extended that I was this curious kid. I played with his grandkids and stuff. And I was just into, you know, this was my world. Wow, that's so cool. I love that your biggest takeaway is that it could be done. And um, what are some of the skills that you learned that you're able to translate into your own practices to do it? Well, I think, you know, I had a lot of room for my mother, which was, you know, I think back and I like go, I don't know if I would let my kid go loose in my yard that had, you know, we had a gardener that came and kept everything tidy, but I, I hated like the fact that we had all this dead grass. My mother just refused to, to irrigate this, this grass. Mm -hmm. We had these big trees and stuff like that. And, um, and, you know, so like I had this one thing, this one summer where I just decided I was going to irrigate that yard. And so it had a slope to it. And so I was creating, I was like digging up channels everywhere to send water through the whole place. And you know, how did that work? Huh? You know, it. I mean, I got to see that, you know, that you could do something like that. You know, but long before I ever knew about drip irrigation or knew about um, soaker hoses or anything like that, I was just trying to figure out how do you do it without having these sprinklers that, you know, never work really effectively. You know, it it was a very, it was like trying to do things in a very um, uh, standard way. And it was like, you know, that was not, you know, there were no answers in that, you know, but anyway, I had my garden plot. I, you know, I just was trying to take more land. That's <laughs> what I was trying to do. I was, um, you, know, I, you know, I had my garden and I, from 10 years old on, I had a garden. So it wow. was, it was really part of my world. That's super cool. Let's go back to your art and um, mm -hmm. using natural fibers and colors. What's what's transformational about that for you? Okay, so when early in my career, very early, um, when I was first introduced 
to weaving and I was doing off loom weaving and I was just, I, I would go into some of the stores. It was the mid seventies and it was a period of time when the Bay area was in California was the central place for textiles. And that period of time was textiles were the second largest craft in the country. And, um, and it was just exploding. And so there were lots of, of stores and I would go into this one store and they had all these baskets of all of these beautiful yarns and they were really thick, some of them, and they were, and some changed shape and they had many different qualities. And I just was like, oh my God, these are like so great things. They don't have to look like knitting yarn. And you know, and that led me to learning to spin. And then that learned me, that took me in the direction of finding a little book. Like my first book was on um, making dyes from, from like supermarket dyes. So I would go and buy frozen fruit and and learned how to make dyes and stains from all of that, you know. And and then I apprenticed with a master weaver who at the time had just finished a major book on natural dyes. And in working with her, it was like her kitchen was like a chemistry lab. And when I would first, when I would go there, I even for years for um until close to the time that she died when I would go to visit her the first thing she would do is I would park and she would greet me and we would walk through her dye garden mm. and so I just learned so much I you know she taught me Latin though she was my first exposure to Latin names for plants and you know, and just really the qualities of the dye, are they light fast? Are they color fast? What are your best solutions? Um, and so I very much fell in love with that as a mode of operating. Mm. And what is your most favorite part of connecting people with the land and using natural materials? I think that it's the grounding. Mm -hmm. I think that I think that by using natural things that you're actually helping to establish ground for yourself where you're really in touch with the soil and what humans are capable of and what humans have been doing since the you know the earliest of times. That's really, really important to me. You know, I think I've, it's been reinforced over and over again through my learning process, just that, you know, I mean, I, I'm one of these people that thinks about the air that we breathe has the same molecules that the dinosaurs had and that the, um, and that everything is just, you know, it's recycled and it's recycled and how important that is, you know, we need it to survive. And so having that and knowing, knowing that and getting to experience it means that you're just touching a little bit closer to humanity. Mm. Mm. Karen, tell me about the moment or the first time you noticed that there was healing in the in the work that you're doing as an artist and as a farmer. And tell me what that moment was like, like what you felt and what you just knew in your heart and in your soul. Um, my teenage years were really, really harsh. They were a period of time when my parents were divorced. My mother was having a breakdown basically through my entire teenage years. And I had to 
take on a lot of the stabilization of our house. And that for me, you know, I think my grandmother knew she could see that I needed I needed the dirt because the dirt would help me to ground to be able to, you know, be calm and be myself as much as possible as I had to do things. I would say that I realized I, you know, I was in my late teens when I started weaving and that I think it was by my, I didn't identify it with my very first weaving, but definitely by my second weaving, I realized there was something that went on in my my whole physiology that changed while I was sitting and using my hands and working. And over time, I saw that I had that power that I could do that. And I knew that especially weaving more than anything else was that stabilizing force for me. And that, you know, I needed to spend, you know, I would organize how I worked to um, uh, over the course of like the year so that it was spread out enough to try to stabilize myself. Mm -hmm. And how is that connected to farming for you? Oh my God, farming just makes me happy. That's my happiest time that there is. It, it is just, you know, it it's problem solving. I love to solve problems. I love finding solutions to, to things and to working, you know, it's not like, you know, it's just the hours that I'm out there working. It's really the hours that I'm thinking about it of trying to figure out, you know, different solutions. Mm -hmm. You know, like I'll give you an example. Um, we built a little greenhouse. It's like 10 by 13 feet. And, um, and I was determined I was not using any electricity in it. And, you know, it gets cold in Northern New Mexico. And I'm like going, I'm gonna grow year round in this thing. And so I use some of the logic that I had from a class that I took in passive solar, like when I was 17, when I was like first in college, and you know, and was and knew about black barrels of water as heat storage <laughs> and stuff like that. And then I put that together with this this woman that I saw I on one of my Facebook forum things that I was following that said that the way that she kept her animal troughs from freezing was by taking soda bottles and putting salt water in the soda bottles to keep it from freezing. So I took our barrel, 55 gallon drum, filled it with water, took 20 soda bottles and put salt water in all of those. And it was left the greenhouse in a temperate zone through the entire season. And, Amazing. you know, and, and that's like what, those are like the total high points, you know, and now I'm looking at, okay, now, now that I've like done this soil workshop and I've done this and I've done that, and we have a new BCS, you know, that, you know, now I'm going to take this soil, which is you know, high desert soil, it's really deficient in a lot of things. We live in a valley that is quite large. I mean, we're not that many miles from like Santa Fe and not that many miles as far, if you're in a car, it's not that many miles, but there is nowhere to get bulk compost. Mm in our entire valley. And, and that's, 
you know, so we've got this pitiful lows <laughs> and, um, you know, and that's what you have to rely on. And I'm like, you know, okay, there's got to be some solutions to, to this soil thing. You know, because otherwise I'm paying, I'm paying almost more in shipping, oh, I mean, yes. more in trucking than I am for the compost. Yeah, so true. So true. You know, so, so I, I'm like trying to, to solve these different kinds of, of problems and stuff. I love it. I love, I love that. Um, you talked about, um, about uh so you're an artist and you're a farmer and i'm wondering what has surprised you most about the your the journey of being an artist and what you've learned i i because because making is so important to me and because it has been so healing to me through my whole life Mm -hmm. I, the biggest thing was when I discovered, it took me a long time. Like sometimes I kind of have a hard head. So it takes me a bit to get, get something, really get it. And I just could not imagine that racism existed in my field. That was like, you know, this is what gives me the greatest joy in the world. This is all of this stuff and and I was like okay now at first I was just I was upset I was hurt I was I withdrew and I withdrew to kind of ground myself and to really find what where I could learn more what what mm -hmm. I needed to know because my within the field of textiles it's within North America it's primarily a history base of colonial textiles which everyone is exposed to but through the majority of the world there are people of every shade that are making the most beautiful things the most beautiful accessing the most beautiful points working very close to the land mm -hmm. you know they they don't consider themselves artists they consider themselves you know they might be a shaman or they might mm -hmm. be a farmer or they might be this or they might be that and they make they may make utilitarian things or they make they make things other things for beauty um but they're they're very connected and so it kind of took me on a whole quest of discovering what my true art was mm -hmm. um tell us how you're rewriting that story and maybe you can share us an example um i rewrite the story by looking at my own world. I decided that my study of anthropology, um, and I found anthropology to be the best lens for me. It was better than history. It was better than um, sociology. It was one where I was able to look at the cultures of people, but also to look at um, the um, the biology of humans as well. And so to me, it was really the process of, um, of first studying my own family, mm -hmm. you know, turning the lens, like why did, you know, you know, I, I basically said to myself that, um, if Picasso could have beautiful women as his muse, then I could have history and story as mine. Beautiful. And, you know, and 
a place that I think that it, an example being is I do a lot of residencies because they take me, they're usually short stints of like a month, two months, and I'll go to a place and I really just kind of do my best to immerse myself in that location. And um, one that I took was in Northern Nevada. And it was a really difficult place for me to be, but in the process, um, I was shown petroglyphs for my very first time. And petroglyphs, I just was so blown away that I was looking at artwork that went back so far. And it, again, it was not people that considered themselves artists that were making it. And I then I met these two women and I heard them talking and they were going to um, they were going to a large petroglyph site. And I just like interject and said, can I go with you? You know, and it was, it was like three hours of, um, on BLM land, no roads, you know, bumping along and stuff. And we couldn't find it because it's not a place, there are no maps to get there. And we decided we were going to turn around and all of a sudden we saw a marker that we had someone had read about and it said turn at that point and you'll go through some shallow water and then you'll be there and we were there and it was you know these petroglyphs that were 10 to 13 um thousand wait see or 1300 years ago and um and it was they date back to when to the, like as water nevada was completely under was submerged and it was the process of the water evaporating and they would so the top ones um would be the first ones and then they would come down and they were it was like oh 80 feet of them of tumbled rocks wow. and and it was like oh my god I I just you know here I was doing all this work with ancestors ancestral work and here I was meeting the ancients and that has had such a major influence on my work you know that I and it's one of the reasons I love living in New Mexico is mm -hmm. to be among all of these petroglyphs again. Mm -hmm. And so I know that, you know, it's in New Mexico, it's one of the the earliest settlements of humans on this uh, in the United States. What is the United States now? Wow, that's so powerful. So powerful, Karen. And what what is your vision? So uh, with your farm and mm -hmm. your artwork moving forward? Um, well, I've been, I feel really lucky that I like made this, you know, pretty quick decision to make this move and found this property and bought it and changed my life, presto changeo. And, um, you know, and that, my art career has just like been been like on a on a clear trajectory since then. Um, and I just keep hope it keeps going, <laughs> and that you know with the farm, what my goal is is there's a property next door that I'd like to be able to annex. And I would like to set up an artist residency there so that I could bring in one artist at a time mm -hmm. and bring in BIPOC, BIPOC artists who never get the relief. The majority never get the relief, especially people that are, that are young parents that, um, you know, never get to, 
to go somewhere and feel that kind of place where they can breathe and they can see natural beauty. And, you know, and I feel so lucky that I met, you know, met people along my path that they gave me those little, those little weekends where my kids and I could just go camping and stuff and be, be in different centers and stuff mm -hmm. that, that really just rejuvenated me. Mm -hmm. That's super cool. What, what does an artist residency look like? Um, well, the main thing is time and place, mm -hmm. you know, so that I see being able to give someone a place to stay where they can stay for a month, where they can have, um, have a studio space that's all theirs because frequently people don't know what it's like to have a real studio. They're using their living room, they're using a back bedroom, whatever it is, you know? And so they have a dedicated space where they can go and work. And then they have the opportunity to come and work on the farm, see what the farm is like, be with my animals who will entertain them to no end. And, um, you know, and, and just learn things and spend time with us, you know. So, you know, it's a very small kind of intimate way of giving back, I think. Hmm. And, um, What's a lesson from nature that you've learned that's transformed your life and the way you see the world? Well, I think my animals give me a lot of those kinds of lessons. One of the things that I really like to see is I like to see cross-species interactions. And so, you know, when I watch the relationship between my ducks, my geese, my goats, you know, my chickens who are the little thieves, and, you know, but that they all have these relationships that are going on. I think there's so much to learn and, you know, so much about, you know, uh, ways that we can be as human beings and appreciate similarities and differences. Tell me more about that. Um, like, well, I think that I, one of the things that I really get out of where I live is that it's so much layered histories. Mm. You know, so I live right next to a Pueblo and that culture. And in New Mexico, the Pueblo culture is very strong. You feel it. Um, and if you don't respect it, you have no business being there really. Um, and then you have the overlay of the Spanish settlers, because this, I live exactly where the Spanish first settled. And this was their agricultural land. And so you have many of the same, of descendants of those original families are still there. Mm. And so there are things like that. And then we also have um, Los Alamos, which is within a half hour. And, you know, so you have, you have these really, really different populations and stuff. And yet there, there is a relatively smooth, um, energy that flows. 
I can feel that harmony when you're talking about it. It's very powerful. Yeah, I Our mean, it's really nice because like a city like Santa Fe, which is really close, has had, has so much, um, you know, it's primarily white at this point. Hmm. And it's like where I am, it's like, there's no question. This is the brown part of the world, you know? And so it's very easy for me. It means I don't have to, you know, um, go through the feelings of, you know, un discomfort, you know, being watched in a, in a store or something like that. I wish I had more options, but, mm -hmm. you know, um, there's just like, okay, you can kind of let down in it. Mm. Mm. What do you want, what, what would your wish be for people to have a deeper understanding of around that? <laughs> Racism is deep. Mm. <laughs> it's really deep. It's really exhausting to have to live with. Um. It's really, you know, that it ages people at this incredible, incredible rate. Mm. And that, you know, and at the same time, I want to, you know, tell people, I want to really, you know, stand up on a bleacher and yell out to people that, um, you know, you can actually begin to heal yourself. That's right. And it sounds like you are doing that. It sounds like I you're try really hard to, you know, you know, my ultimate goal in life is to leave the world a little better with a little more knowledge from my having stood on the ground. Mm -hmm. And you and are. And you know, that, you know, that there really are these ways of learning that are, you know, that are really, I don't know, beautiful, I think. Yeah. Um, one thing I really want to encourage people to do is go and check out some of your videos because your videos and the way you tell the story about the creation of your art is just next level. It's like we're taking on, we're taking on a journey with every piece that you walk us through. Do you have any pieces of your art um, close by Karen that you could share with us? No, <laughs> no, I didn't. I didn't think about that. Yeah. And I'm on so, a residency, so I can't. Um, that's right. You are. So <laughs> anyways, I just really encourage people to go and uh, visit Karen's YouTube channel at um, Karen, Karen Hampton 4724. And um, you can watch her interviews and and, and to see some of the artwork that she's done and the story behind the artwork. It's very profound and very powerful and gives a lot of new insights into what you may or may not see when you look at Karen's art and then other artists as well. It, it changes, it changes um, our tapestry within, not just through what we see visually. Yeah, yeah it's... I I use it as a storytelling vehicle. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, there are, you know, every, every, whatever story I'm telling, whatever story, it's going to be something that really has, you know, like grabbed my, my things that, you know, it makes me think, it makes me, it gives me joy. It gives me pain, mm -hmm. you know? pain is something to be experienced. So you experience it and then maybe you learn something new. Yeah. Yeah. I'm so curious. Um, I love the, the couple little garden hacks you shared with us. And are there any other um, little tricks or hacks that you learned along the way that you are looking forward to incorporating into your little farm there in New oh. Mexico? You know, I'm just, you know, we, we function on, um acequia water so ditch water that we're like for for farming 
So in our case, we go across the road and to the side of our neighbor's place and there's a big wheel and you turn it on when you're allowed to, to, to get your water flowing. And it's the reason that I haven't, it, I haven't gone that far yet. Because I first had to just like, okay, let me, I'm just going to use this well water and see, you know, you know, do as much as I can do. So then I set up a side garden first and then a front raised bed garden. And then it's like, okay, now it's time to really get into the Asakia water. And so, you know, I've been really looking at, you know, um, the harnessing of during my al allocated time, harnessing water and then setting up drip feed from that mm -hmm. to irrigate. So, you know, I'm thinking about that. Um, also really, we live in a very, very windy valley. And so I'm, I'm really, looking and feeling the land to feel where the trees should go because it's really you know it it's so exciting to for me to move on to a piece of property that was not landscaped mm -hmm. you know but it means everything i do has to be you know i really want it to be the right thing to do at that point mm -hmm. so, your piece of advice for new farmers, uh, I thought was so powerful. And that is to study the land, understand the water, the wind, and how you'll irrigate the land and listen to the stories of your neighbors and what they have to, to share. And I'm just curious, mm -hmm. um, how do you study the land? Like, how do you really get a good feel for the land? Well, I, I first got that exposure when I took that passive solar class a zillion years ago, you know, because it said you should not build until you've lived on your land for a year. And as, you know, as much as you want to do that, you want to just move on and put your ideas on down and you're going to, it's your land and you can do what you want there you know you don't know anything that land has existed for all of this time before and so for me it was i put in a small garden and i could i could kind of choose it cuz i could see oh someone else has had a little garden over in this spot they have they kind of set up a little bit of a of a barrier from the wind coming out from, cause I could see where the wind was coming from. And then, but I was like going, you know, here I have this big open space. Everything I do is gonna be so important. You know, just sit, just be still as hard as it is. And it's very hard for me. Um, You know, last year I, purchased um uh a few well more than a few trees and I was like you know I was nursing them and everything keeping them till I thought it was the right time in the spring to plant and everything which would have been the case in you know in so many other places but it was so wrong because what you need to do is you need to plant in the fall mm -hmm. so that they have a time for their roots to establish before they have to handle all of the wind. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and it's like, you know, so bad. I lost about probably half of the trees I had purchased. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. you know, listen to your own advice. Yeah, good learning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Karen, for sharing just a small part of your journey with us. Is there anything else you want to leave us with um, before we wrap up that we didn't touch on? Mm -hmm. <clears throat> it's really just that, that fun 
is is huge you know that you know don't do anything if you're not getting joy out of it you know life should be giving you joy and then so maybe if it's not looking quite right then just shift things a little and see if you can find a happy place Amen to that. I love it. Thank you. And what does what does regeneration mean to you? Um, it really means creating an environment that is circular, where you're encouraging that everything is purposeful and that you're creating an environment for 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 the cycle of life to continue. Makes sense, it's beautiful. Thank you. I feel like there's something, I feel like I wanna ask you another question and I'm not too sure what it is, but it's around, um, um, I think it's just really simple. What are you, what are you most grateful for right now? I'm grateful that I found my piece of land. <laughs> I spent my whole life looking for my piece of land mm -hmm. and always feeling like, you know, I've lived in great places. There's never been, um, I always felt like I had good housing karma, yeah. but I really feel like I found my spot it feels like that for me too when um because we just worked with Brandon in one of our programs and I just got I got goosebumps so many times when he was talking about your farm and your studio and what you're creating and your dreams and how you're building you know he talked about it being one of the most difficult places to to farm and to build the soil because it's um, it's New Mexico and it's it's extreme temperatures it's um, but people would consider poor soil. And so I, I, I stand with you in that Karen and I'm feeling the power of your presence on that land and the incredible transformation that is not just going to be experienced by the land and the soil, but for you and Brandon and everyone who has the gift of interacting with you. So thank you for the incredible work that you're doing. Thank you. Yeah. Well, it's been an honor. Thank you for your time today. Thank you. Be sure to go and check out Karen's art at kdhampton.com. You can also find her on Instagram at k.d28, on Facebook at karen.hampton, and on Pinterest. She was one of the very first people on Pinterest at kdhampton1. And on YouTube, you can search her name, Karen Hampton 4724. At the time of this interview, they don't have any website up for their brand new farm, which is Alcolda Studio and Farm. That's A-L-C-A-L-D-E Studio and Farm. So you can look that up and see if there's anything going on yet. The next time you're walking, on your land and on your soil, maybe even barefoot. Just notice how nourishing it is. Notice the magic around you. And I just want to leave you with the living question and reflection. What does the healing power of land and soil mean to you? How does that show up for you? What surfaces when you reflect on that? And what do you notice when you sit still? with nature, maybe with your farm or your garden or in your fields or in the plants or the animals, the ecosystem that you are stewarding and a part of. What does the healing power of land and soil mean to you and how does that show up? You make yourself an amazing day. Big love. Thank you so much for joining us at Heart and Soil. We deeply appreciate you and love you, and we wish you many bright blessings.